Hey everyone, Harley here. Uh, welcome back to another episode of The Life of a Rebel. And on today's episode of The Life of a Rebel, I have the pleasure of speaking with Chris Doe. Chris is an Emmy-winning creative director. He has been uh, a leader in the brand and design space for years. He's the CEO and founder of creative agencies Blind, as well as The Future, which has created some of the best content available for entrepreneurs on YouTube today. Uh, Chris, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, Harley. Uh, I watched a bunch of videos that you've done, a lot of interviews, but I want to start with something that I actually had not learned um, I want to talk a bit about your childhood, and I'm curious, um, were you really passionate as a kid? I think so, but I didn't know where to put that passion. Uh, I'm, I'm a creative person, but being an immigrant and a refugee coming to America, I think the, the ideas and dreams of being an artist and pursuing that creative life wasn't really a reality that I could entertain in any serious way. As a first-generation immigrant, my parents sacrificed a lot to provide a better life for us, and I felt... To be an artist, to be a designer would do, would be to do something very frivolous and waste the opportunity and the sacrifice they had made. So I put that way, 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 way back there and thought, let me just do what they want me to do. It's so interesting because uh, my, my dad immigrated to Canada from Eastern Europe in 56. And when he came over here, his, his dad uh, and actually his family, for the most part, they became entrepreneurs, not because they wanted to, not because they were passionate about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship in those days as a new immigrant was really about survival. And in many ways, my, my dad did not want to be an entrepreneur because it felt like, well, to your point, Chris, like that, that I, they wanted something better for him. And now that, you know, I'm sort of now third generation, entrepreneurship to me is like the greatest way to self-actualize, to find this creativity. And I think so much about life's work. I think so much about how the best part of living in, in, in the current world right now is that you actually can take something you love and, and make a living doing it. And and entrepreneurship is, is sort of the manifestation of that for me. It's just, it encompasses all of it. I'm curious, you know, when was the first moment you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and, and what was your very first business? My uncle, he owned a liquor store and he got access to all kinds of candy, candy that you couldn't buy anywhere else at wholesale prices. Mm -hmm. I would tell my cousin, hey, I want to put in an order next time your dad orders something and I'm going to go sell candy. But I'm an introvert and I'm really not really comfortable being around people. So I quickly figured out I can buy the candy and I can pay other kids to sell the candy for me. They make a little bit of money. I'll make most of the money and it works out just fine. And I started that, that kind of put me on that path of entrepreneurship or business owner. But you'd have to sell a lot of candy to, for it to, to add up to anything. So I, especially you know, if you're splitting I, the profit margin with some other yeah. kids who are basically your, your, your commission salespeople. Yeah. And the, it, here's the weird thing that I also did was when kids would buy the candy, they would then eat it and just throw the wrappers on the floor. And I wasn't sure if was, I was allowed as a student in junior high to be able to do that. So I paid other kids to pick up the trash to clean it up. And so I was like, this doesn't scale. This is not working. Like I need to figure out something bigger than this. And I've tried many other things, failed many times until I found what it is that I'm good at. I want to talk about uh, the future and, and not I want the future in terms of your thing, the future, not the future in terms of the future tense. Um, yeah. I want to talk about what inspired you to start this thing, because it is not a sort of a typical business to start. Um, clearly, you have you know, some reservations about the efficacy of the traditional education system. And, and I'm curious how that all kind of fit together and, and led to you starting this thing. Yeah, the birth of the future is one of inspiration and conflict. And there's a little story here. So in 2014, one of my college friends from Art Center asked me, like, let's go make YouTube videos together. And that was the farthest thing from my mind. And this is 2014, so I'm like, uh, isn't YouTube really for a lot of hacks and wannabes and amateurs or entertainers, people who are trying to flex and do comedy skits? That is not me. I'm not comfortable in being uh, in front of camera. But he did something that was super generous, and he said, you know, why don't you just sit there? You don't even have to say anything. He's an extrovert. He's self-described loud and obnoxious. And so he would do the show and I would just sit there, jaw clenched. And afterwards, I would have this really aching pain and I couldn't figure out why. Why does my jaw hurt so much? And then I realized I was so tense during the show that that's what was causing it. Now, fast forward 10, 20 episodes in, I'm getting a little more comfortable on camera. I can actually say my name and introduce myself. <laughs> so we're making progress here. And two years into starting the YouTube channel, we started to figure out this is actually a viable platform to teach. And... I've been teaching for 15 years and then 
I, I, the, my two goals overlap. I want to teach, and I want to teach to a much broader group of people versus the 10 or 12 students I have in my class. And so those goals aligned. Was any part of, you know, I, I wish there was this thing that my kids can go through, which is not exactly the traditional system where we don't really teach entrepreneurship. We don't really teach creativity in schools. In fact, some would argue we do the opposite because we say, look, this is a finite game. Do well on this test so the teacher can get, you know, uh, some percentage bell curved of his or her students uh, and they get a raise or they get to you know keep their tenure. Yeah, there's I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you I'm an expert at this, but there's some fascinating pieces of content from really inspirational thought leaders who who study education and, and try and tell us what the system was designed for, which was essentially to create human robots to drop into a factory, drop into a trench in a war and be replaceable. And so we're teaching to the norm, to the average, to the middle, high performers and low performers get neglected and we're just bending everyone to be the same. So Ken Robinson talked about this. He's like, it's not so much that we grow into creativity, it's that we grow out of it because the school systems stamp out any individuality, any quirk, any weirdness, because we learn really early on, we have to go along to get along. So we, we suppress who we are. And I very much as an immigrant, as an Asian American growing up in mostly a white society, very much like the outsider, just desperately wanting to be in. And I spent the most part of my uh, young adulthood as a person who just had not a lot of uh, love for myself, trying to be invisible. My introversion obviously didn't help, but I mean, I, I got uh, I got into some fist fights with people who were just, I don't know how else to describe it, but bullies and borderline racists. Just because I look different and now we're gonna have some issues, right? And so we, we have to work against that. This mission of future, to teach 1 billion people how to make a living doing what they love. Um, I wanna ask why that's so important to you. And I also wanna talk about this idea of breaking the traditional concept of work-life balance and this idea that you have work and you have life and never the two should meet and your nine to five is your work and everything else is your life. Um, I, I, I've, I've spoken a lot about this, uh, both on the show, but, but, but elsewhere that the greatest part of being an entrepreneur is that for many entrepreneurs, certainly for me, my personal interests and my professional interests are completely aligned and, and, and there's, there's freedom in that. So want to first talk about, you know, how you think about that idea of, of separating the two and, and, and making a living doing what you love and then why, you know, this idea of teaching 1 billion people is so important. Sure. I think it's a very popular thing that people will say you need to have balance, balance, balance. There's work and then you have to have your life. But that creates a, a fractured self, a fractured identity, fractured goals. So when I'm working, then I'm sacrificing my life balance. And when I'm doing things with my family, with my kids or my my partner, then I'm neglecting the business. And I don't see it like that at all. You're, and you're absolutely right. We're, we're totally in 100% alignment here in that the more these two circles can overlap, the happier, healthier, and wealthier you're going to be. And I think the age in which we live in now, it's not a pipe dream. It's possible that you can literally work from anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection and you're powered by your ideas and in the market will validate whether or not your idea is good or not. You don't need a gatekeeper, a middle person to determine like you're worthy of being in the market space. Like if you think about publishers, the editors get to decide whose ideas get proliferated and for better or for worse they tend to be white men right so but right now if i'm a i'm a gay black woman and, and, I'm, and I'm in my early 20s i can write a piece and reach out to an audience and the market itself will validate and it's not being controlled by a few people and, and i think there's, that's there's extreme. a meritocracy to it that didn't exist i think previously. so Yes. I mean, that's the beauty of YouTube and the other social platforms is somebody has an idea and your idea lives in the world of the marketplace of ideas. And whether it's good or not is determined by just a, a very, mer like like you said, a meritocracy where the best ideas win. That's the theory at least, right? It's less like work-life balance, but work-life overlap. And the more that you can have it overlap, the better off you are. Yeah, there's like a harmony to it, right? And this idea that you have to separate the two almost insinuates that the thing you love doing is not the thing that will actually pay. You know, there there are currently about 1.7 million merchants on Shopify. I get to get to meet a lot of them, not all of them, of course, but I get to watch a lot of them. And I'm curious, you know, when you're working with a client, 
just before you, you like just when you start working with them at the beginning and the onset of a project and a, and, a, and a particular file that you decide to, 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 to commit to, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see clients make when it comes to branding or marketing in general? Oftentimes designers think a brand is a logo. It's not a logo. I mean, the logo is a part of it and a brand isn't all the ads or the impressions that you make. That's not it either. And, and ultimately, I love Marty Neumeyer's definition of a brand, which I think is the most complete it's a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. And so you can't control what a person's gut feeling is, but you can influence it. And how you influence this is you show up, you say what you do, you do what you say, and you do it consistently enough over time to enough people. And then if enough people have that same gut feeling, you have a brand. What is the difference between um, brand and branding and, and how you make sure both tell the same message to those different types of consumers of, of whatever you're selling, be it service or a product? I think there, are, as far as I know, two ways to develop your brand. You can sit around and say, this is who we are and, and this is what we do and this is why it matters and then find your audience. And that's the way that many people do it. So I make a thing and I think everybody must need this thing. We must have the same problem. And then you can find out in the product market fit if it works out or not. And sometimes it's misaligned. The other way to do this is to actually study people and to say, like, I am fascinated by this very small group of people. And once I study them well enough, I am I'm, I'm able to identify patterns, challenges, roadblocks, wins, losses. And then I see an opportunity wherever there's a gap. There's an opportunity wherever there's a failure, an obstacle. There is an opportunity. And so if you're going to be a customer or user centric brand, you study the behaviors of people first. You identify a problem and you build a solution for them. I love this approach because you're almost guaranteed a higher um, higher fit rate in terms of the product market fit because you're actually studying them. You're not studying yourself. And so now we can say uh, we, we want to create this for you because we see this problem. I'll give you an example. Uh, maybe this is not a great example, but it's an example. Heinz Ketchup. For many, many years, for however long, for maybe for over 100 years, they've made it in a glass bottle and points up and we all have the same problem. How to get the ketchup out of the bottle. And then Heinz started to look at it from the point of view of the customer. Why not turn the bottle upside down or right side up, basically, so that the cap is at the bottom, so it's always draining to the bottom via gravity. And why do we need to put in a glass bottle? We should put in a squeezy bottle. They now have a customer-centric product or customer-centric brand. It's not about us, it's about you. What is some advice you'd give to someone uh, who may or may not have the means to hire Chris, who may not have the means to hire an agency or a freelancer, but who really wants to nail that branding. Are there a couple of things that you'd say, look, if you're not going to do anything else, do these things? Yeah, I would say sit around and try to figure out your origin story, like why you matter. You can just ask yourself this question beyond money. Why do we exist? Why did we even create this company product service in the first place? What are we trying to do? How are we planning to impact the world in a positive way? Once you figure that out, you can have a story. That's your origin story. It needs to have conflict, probably a call to action. And then what you learned when you, when you went on that adventure. Okay. The next part is to be able to reduce that story down so that it becomes very easy to remember. And I take people through this process. You take this long story and you got to keep condensing it down. So it's easier to remember and it's repeatable. Earlier, I mentioned some things about my introverted nature that we're refugees. That's a lot to tell someone. And so now I just use a two word brand, which is I'm a loud introvert. And that will clue people into not everything, but enough so that I'm different and people can remember me. In the world, there's lots and lots of introverts. And then also in the world, there's a lot of loud people. But you don't find too many loud introverts. And that's where I'm like the magical donkey, you know, and I'll just say it like that. I don't want to even say unicorn because it makes it seem too, so special. Mm -hmm. So we talk about things like blue ocean strategy. Go where nobody's at and claim some of that white space where nobody's paying attention to. And that's what I do. And then if you take those two words, loud introvert, and you create an icon of some sort, and if you keep talking about this consistently over time, an abstract icon can go and then represent something else. Like you see the Coca-Cola swirl, the Nike swoosh, they don't really mean anything unless the company that is represented by this icon, by this, this logo type or whatever, lives up to their promise and consistently delivers a pleasant experience. And then we, we, we attribute all kinds of stories and meaning into an abstract symbol. And so 
I would go through that process. I love the idea of the origin stories being one thing that we can all do because the truth is we sort of create our own origin stories. And even if you were to go to an amazing agency or someone to help you kind of figure out that, they're not gonna be able to tell you your origin story. I mean, they can give you hints once they hear it, but that's something you have to sort of articulate and diarize yourself and like, here's why we're doing it. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. I, I love that way of thinking about it. Um, what is your favorite pre piece of branding that was not developed by you or your team? Something that you've just seen out there and like, oh man, I, I, I really love that. That really hits home for me. You know, there's a church, uh, I think it's uh, First Presbyterian Church and it's right here in Santa Monica and it's on Second Street. And you're like, a church? A church? Mm -hmm. But you know, it's really <laughs> interesting because you think, I mean, churches get a bad rap, sometimes well-deserved, but there's a church and they're they're taking a very different approach they're saying we're, we're really inclusive all people are welcome we're going to try to live by our faith and not by dogma and so they'll they'll have like funny little banners outside and one of them is like um uh, come in for a faith lift and they're using this kind of west side los angeles vernacular yeah, very la yeah very la and there's a couple others i can't remember off the top of my my head but I don't, I'm, I don't go to church and I'm like, I remember this and I will tell people this is a great example of how you can share your message in just very clever copywriting just to kind of stand for the core values. Yeah. What's so amazing about that particular example is that relative to other branding and, and, and frankly, marketing messaging that you'd see from any religious institution, whether it's a church or a mosque or a synagogue, you would never see that type of creativity. So not only is that interesting just that from the perspective of it came from a place I wouldn't ex I wouldn't have anticipated, but also the fact that relative to the thoughtfulness, you know, their competitors are, are putting in, it's really quite amazing. Yeah, I'd like to add one last little thing because I've been thinking about this. Branding happens in places where nobody's looking. So we often think of the logos and the clever taglines and these wonderful ad campaigns. But really it happens in the, in these dark, invisible places where your brand goes to live or to die in the minds of the people that you serve. I had a friend and he's part of a very large advertising conglomerate and they usually stay at the Ritz Carlton uh, when they do these big retreats, but they decided to stay at a local hotel, uh, one that's not part of a chain that was very well reviewed. And he said he remembered like uh, they had done something that, where they all went for a walk and so his shoes got dirty. And so that day he went to change his shoes and then he, he went and did some other event and function. So he left his dirty shoes behind. When he came back, those shoes were cleaned. And that is where your branding lives because that is service. And they were just telling and sharing that story over dinner. It's like, and what did they do? What did they do for you? You know, and that attention to detail says something like you can talk all you want about service. And then if your people don't live up to that promise, you don't really have a brand. So look in those invisible places. Yeah, in that case, it's less about the shoes and more about how that place made him feel. That 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 made your or made her feel like they made your friend feel special. Yes, I, I love that, Chris. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you for joining us in the life of Rebel. Uh, that mission to teach one billion people how to make a living doing what they love—that is such an amazing, inspiring mission. And and in many ways, you and I are 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 um, are, are, are sort of co-patriots on a very similar mission uh, around this idea of, of getting people to do something they love and then be able to live a life based on that, whether it's yes. entrepreneurship or it's art. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Harley. Now, I'll teach people and then you're going to empower them with the tools and technologies. That, that, that is the right here. setup. You teach yep. them. And, and we will give them the tools to actually go and execute. Beautiful. Together, we can actually do this. I mean, it's funny. There's that. There's an interesting quote uh, in the future. I think it was, um, uh, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Yep. That's the Andy Warhol quote, right? It, Andy Warhol, exactly. I always think about in the future, what would happen if everyone was an entrepreneur for 15 days? Would that change how people look at the world? Would that change how people think about their work and their life? And so um, you and I together uh, can, can help one another. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to spend some time with you. Beautiful. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much.